I kind of want to show you how fast travel works in my game as an example of the way that you could set this up. There's a lot of different parts that come together to make this work, so it's not exactly going to be a step-by-step -step tutorial, but hopefully you can follow along more or less. The way to implement fast travel is so context-sensitive to the way that you work with loading your levels and that kind of stuff, that making a singular, even halfway useful tutorial that you can follow step-by-step isn't really going to work, but the general concept should remain fairly similar throughout most things. So here, what I have is a fast travel point. So if I open that up, what we get is just a static mesh, a holder, obviously, and an arrow. This arrow is going to be the location and rotation that your player spawns in at this fast travel point. So what's nice about that is in any individual fast travel point, what I can do is I can actually move this arrow around to wherever I want it to be at, which is quite nice. I can rotate it around to make you face a different way. These arrows are really useful for stuff like that. Just going to set this back to default though, because that's quite good for now. Then this thing implements my interaction interface, and that's just basically a function that I can run on any object that is interactable in my game. That does a couple of different things for me. Number one is it's going to check, is this fast travel point unlocked to begin with? In my game, all fast travel points need to be unlocked, so you can only fast travel to places you've already been at. If we are not unlocked yet, we just run unlock fast travel points, and what that does is... It just gets the save objects that we're currently working with. If you're wondering how that works, I have a video about good practices with save objects and how you can keep a live save object throughout your play session that you can update in real time to keep all of the relevant information either between levels or just easily a lot of objects writing their own states to that save object. That's what this does. My save object has a array of unlocked fast travel points. And whenever I unlock a fast travel point, I just add the name of this thing as a unique entry to that array. Add unique just in case I have two of the same or whatever. These are name variables, so keep that in mind. These aren't strings or anything. They're optimized to be able to be compared easily, which we'll get into in a moment. And of course, an is unlocked just does the opposite. It checks, hey, is the name for this one already contained in that list, yes or no. So first time we do this, we unlock the fast travel point. Second time through, it's already unlocked. And then we uh, cast to my player character. I get the canvas for it. That's going to be the canvas that I have that I push all my widgets onto because I use common UI. It's quite nice to just have an empty canvas with just a widget stack on it that I can push activate widgets to whenever I want. So that's what this does. It pushes to that canvas the fast travel map. Just as a real quick example, push uh, to widgets just takes in a widget class, which needs to be an activatable widget. And then it just activates that on a activatable widget stack. Once again, this is something that I've made a tutorial about in the past, about the basics of common UI. And here you can really see why a lot of things are starting to like come together in making a feature for like an actual game instead of something standalone as a tutorial. I'll try to remember to link all the tutorials that I'm referring to in the description of this video and like maybe as a pinned comment. Uh, then I delay until next tick. This shouldn't be necessary. I don't remember why I do it, but it doesn't cause me issues at this point, so I'm not going to remove it. Uh, and set the input mode to game and UI. So that's what I do with my fast travel map. My fast travel map itself is just an image with a bunch of other images inside of it. Those images have a little bit of code to them. I'll show that in a moment. And next to that, we have a size box with a vertical box, and those are the fast travel buttons in my case. This list will hold a bunch more fast travel points in the future, obviously, but this is pre-set up to just have every fast travel point in the game already set up inside of it. Same here, this is going to have a map of the game, and these icons are going to be placed at the respective positions. But these only show up if they actually are already unlocked, which is something that I do in the individual widgets. So I have a specific widget for my fast travel button, and that just checks whenever it gets constructed here in event constructs. We set its visibility based on a select node. So either it's going to be collapsed or visible, depending on whether or not 
my unlock fast travels contains the fast travel name for this button. So that is how I connect these points, which have a variable for a name right here, fast travel point name, center, to these buttons, which also have a fast travel name, which is center, and a display name, which is just a text. These aren't really related to the functionality. It's this variable that does the code stuff. Now, the fact that I'm using names makes it so that I can easily reference things in world from my UI and the other way around because they're just both looking at the same value, the same name. On the other hand, it also opens up the possibility of making typos. So be aware that you don't make typos. And then I also have this dev mode, which just forces everything to always be visible uh, because that's nice to do. Now, every single one of these buttons has a linked icon. And these icons are these little images here, which are their own blueprint as well, which is WBP fast travel icon. And all that that really has is a single event on whether or not it is selected. So uh, we have a image in it, which again, very placeholder image uh, icon that I made. And we just simply set that to being either the minecart texture or the minecart texture selected, which has just got a blue light blue stroke. When I say, hey, you're selected, it's going to get the selected icon. When it's not selected, it's got the unselected icon. Pretty self-explanatory, hopefully. The way that that gets done, though, is through the button that it is linked to. Here on Event Preconstruct, what we do is we set when this button is focused. I get the linked icon and I set it to being selected. When the button loses focus, I set its linked icon to also no longer be selected. So that way you get a little light up for the fast travel icon that you're about to travel to with the button that you have selected. Whenever I click a button, what it does is it uses my level loading system, which again, I've got a basic video on how I like to set up my level loading system using level streaming instead of using open level. So my entire game takes place in a single persistent level and all the individual levels just get streamed in and out. In that system, I also made a fast travel function, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and that just takes in the level that it needs to open. That entire system already works based on level names. So this button just needs to also have the name of the level that it's going to open. Again, in the fast travel map, if I click on any of these buttons, level to open, central hub. This one, one six combat trial. This one, one twelve bus door door. Very bad name. These are just internal names of the actual level assets that they need to refer to to open. So they give that into the game instances code for fast travel. And this just uh, sets the game to unpaused, fast travel to active, because when fast travel is active, it needs to put the character into a different position than normal level transitioning. And then it just runs my normal level load code uh, with whatever level I gave in. And the normal level load code is a little bit more than I'm like happy to go over right now. But in short, what it does is it adds a loading screen for me. It plays a fade-in animation on that loading screen. Then once that is done, it unloads my current level, does some inventory stuff as well, and then it just loads the next level, the one that in most cases the door leads to. In this case, I'm fast traveling to. And this is a latent node. So this is going to just stay here and load this level until it's done, and then only run the rest of this graph once this level is completed. Then it does some more stuff with inventories and all that type of stuff. And then here at some point it starts checking, hey, is fast travel active? Was the traveling that we did, was that fast travel? I also have a bool for checking if it was a player death or a load game, because all those need subtly different ways of dealing with setting the player to a new position. In the case of fast travel though, uh, we just get an actor of class and we just obviously get an actor of our fast travel points class. In my case, I know that my levels are only ever going to have one of those in each level. So it's pretty easy to just say, hey, get actor of class and just get the fast travel points, get its arrow and set the actor's transform to match that arrow. And then of course we set the fast travel back to being false because we're done fast traveling. And then it does the same thing, just cleaning up, uh, doing a fade out animation on the loading screen, all that type of stuff, setting some other information to do with level loading. Again, not really here to dive super deep into every node from our level loading system, but essentially this just works the same way as going between every other level in the game. It just has a function that's got a couple of extra nodes before it to make sure that, hey, uh, we don't have the game as paused anymore because we're 
accessing fast travel through a paused menu, and we just flag a bool as, hey, we're fast traveling, so later on in the code we can check that just because that's the way that I've set it up. But aside from that, there's nothing actually different about this than any normal level loading that I do. Now, if you have multiple fast travel points within a single level, of course, uh, instead of doing get actor of class, you would need to do get all actors of class. And then you'd need to also have some other identification for the point that you're traveling to. Something like maybe a GUID that you're trying to travel to or whatever that you need to also give through in this uh, fast travel function over here. I don't have that, but that would be fairly easy to just slip in there and implement to have levels that have more than one fast travel points inside them. In my case, I only am ever going to really have one fast travel point inside each streaming level, so no real need to implement that. That's a basic overview of how I set up fast travel. So here in-game, if I walk up to this and I unlock this station, I travel, you can see I have everything unlocked here. That is because I'm actually in dev mode. Uh, if I don't have dev mode enabled, I only have the center. It's kind of hard to see maybe in YouTube compression, but center is selected and the corresponding icon is also hot. Turn on dev mode real quick so that I can travel to other things. If I go between these, you probably can notice now it highlights the corresponding little thing. And I can go, for instance, to this level. It does my normal level loading screen transition. And now I'm here, which is kind of on the other side of the map uh, of my current demo build of the game. Nothing inherently that different from how my normal level loading system works. It's just the way that you interact with it requires a little bit more setup on the UI side than just, hey, walk into a door and open the corresponding level. And a very big thank you to all my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help support the channel or get any of the project files in any of my tutorials, there's a link down below to the Patreon page to support me or alternatively as a YouTube member. My cave students, tier supporters, Oiku, Earl, Monserville, Erno, and my cave digger tier supporters, Mauricio Ferrias.